those verses again. So Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10, the Bible reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities, against powers, against rulers, against or, sorry, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take up, take unto you uh, the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, uh, having your loins girt about, uh, girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith... Uh, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take, uh, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying all, always with all prayer and with supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this uh, study that we've been, in, uh, been doing uh, with us, a spirit-filled warfare. And Lord, I pray that uh, as we go through these different uh, uh, pieces of the armor, these uh, different areas of the armor, Lord, I pray that we would begin, uh, begin to understand the significance of it and the reason for it, us uh, needing it in everyday life. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, tonight as we continue uh, examining the, those various pieces of the armor, uh, the various pieces of the whole armor of God and what constitutes those areas. I'm gonna, obviously, I've been taking my time and, and preaching on each, each area of the armor because there's going to come a day in each of our lives when we will need to know what the whole, whole armor of God is. And we will need to know how to use it in our lives. The truth is that we, uh, we, need, uh, to, uh, we need to know about, uh, know about and the use uh, and use the armor every day. We don't always think about it, but it is vitally important in our spiritual lives. We need to realize what the armor of God does in our life and what it, do, uh, what it doesn't do. When I say what it doesn't do, there's, like I said, oftentimes I've heard people, I don't want to say over-spiritualized, but they basically have lied what, what those different areas you know, do. They try to like make it far greater or whatever than what it actually is. And the, the armor of God is very specific because according to verses 10 through 13, which we just read, the saints are engaged in a great cosmic battle against a powerful and relentless enemy. And we know that that enemy is the devil. That enemy is the devil. He attacks us by using the wiles. He, uh, and wiles just simply means tricks, schemes, or methods to undermine your faith and to attack the glory of God. He wants to undermine. He, if, he if he can't have your soul, in which obviously if you're saved, he can't have it. He's going to try and undermine every single thing about your life. He's going to go after your weaknesses, and he's going to try and exploit those, so that way your witness, your testimony as being a believer in Christ is tainted, is messed up, right? And so God desires that we are able to stand against the attacks of the enemy, and we know that the word stand means to hold a critical position during a time of enemy attack, basically to stand our ground. And we know that this is an image, this is a biblical image of a soldier refusing to yield even one inch of the ground to an attacking foe. We are called to stand. We are not to, you know, uh, called to retreat. We are called to stand there. Why? Because Christ has already given, uh, given us all the things. You know, some people say, well, it's to advance. It's not to advance. It's to hold our ground. Why? Because we already have all things in Christ Jesus. We don't have to go on the, uh, you know, uh, the offenses. We just got to be able to hold our ground. Why? Because Christ has given us all things. He's, uh, we, are to, uh, we are protecting the ground that has already been taken from the enemy. That's what the enemy wants us to you know, think is that, oh, there's areas that we need to take back. No, we, uh, it's already, uh, that area has already been taken from the enemy. He wants to get it back. And we don't give it back to him, right? We're not supposed to. And we know that God has blessed his people by giving, uh, giving us some of the very, uh, some very precious things. Like he's given us the truth. He's given us, uh, given us his church. He's given us his word. He's given us grace and salvation and blessing, right? All those things God has given to us. And we don't want to give those things back, right? 
and we have you know so more uh, so much more as well. The problem is is, is that the uh, the problem is is that our enemy, the devil, does not want us to have the things that we have been given by the Lord. He will do everything in his power to strip all those things away from us if he could. What he can uh, what he can't take away from us, he will uh, he will do everything in his power to nullify. If he He's like, you know what, I know I can't take your salvation from you, but I'm going to try and take away your blessing. I know I can't, you know, I can't take away God's word from you, so I'm going to make you doubt it. I know I can't take away God's grace, but I'm going to make sure your testimony is tainted. He's going to do, try to do everything in his power. So if he can't take it, he want, like I said, once he wants to strip those different areas of power in our life. If we would... If we would keep what we have in Christ, we are going to be able to stand and hold, that, uh, hold the ground that we have been given. And obviously, as it says, is that we are to stand and we must put on the whole armor of God in order to do that. If we miss one part of the armor of God, we're vulnerable to that attack, right? If we go out there and we're all decked out but we forgot the, the breastplate, uh, breastplate of righteousness, what's going to happen? He's going to attack that area, which we, you know, we know that that was to, to show you know, the mind and the will of us. You know, that, that controls our emotions. Or if we go out and we, you know, we got everything on, but we forget the helmet of salvation. He's going to go attack that. Or the fact that, you know, we go out there and we don't have the belt of truth on, which everything, you know, uh, stabilizes in the person's life is, uh, is around the belt of truth. So we don't have that. Everything else is going to fall. And we know that the belt of truth you know, speaks of a life that is built, on, uh, built upon the faithfulness of the word of God and to the God of the word. They are one and the same. We know that, you know, that this is the word of God, but who is the living word? Jesus Christ. They are one and the same. If we want to know what God's word says, we're saying, you know what, I want to know what God says. They are one and the same. So we cannot uh, disconnect our life. There's, there's a lot of people that I've met and foolishly, ignorantly have said, I don't need to know all those doctrines in the Bible. I just need to love Jesus. What you are saying is, is, you know, like, I'm going to let anything come in. Because if you don't know the word, Satan's going to attack you because he, he knows that you don't care about reading his word. And you don't care what God has to say. I've heard people say this. I'm not saying that, you know, that has been here. I've heard it at different places where people have made that, uh, that thing, that, that comment, that statement. That, they, that they're like, I don't want to get into all the doctrines. Well, God's word teaches us doctrine. It teach, you know, those are his teachings, right? The belt of truth is what stabilizes us in our life. It gives us stability. Because we can go to this, when all life gives us lies and all these untruths, we can go to God's word, and we know that we are stable. Why? Because God's word is truth. That we can stand upon that word, right? Without the belt, uh, belt of truth, the, uh, the soldier of God will find... The other pieces of armor are uh, useless. Unless our lives and testimonies are rooted in and lived out in truth, we will not be able to stand in the evil day. The other one we looked at was the bre- a breastplate of righteousness, as I give this recap. It speaks of, uh, of a holy life. It speaks of a life that is lived in conformity to God's word. Not only do we have God's word, you know, that belt of truth that we're going on, we must be conformed to it. We must allow God's word to do what in our lives? Change us, transform us, conform us to his image. A, a holy life is a powerful defense against the attacks of the enemy. When we allow sin, in, uh, sin to dwell in our lives, we give, Satan, you know, we give Satan that place where the Bible says, don't give him a place. You know, don't, uh, neither give a place to the enemy or to the devil. And notice what I said, when we allow sin to dwell in our life. I didn't say that we're going to be perfect from it. But if when we allow it, when we let it to, to just dwell there, you know, to make a residence in us, that's when we give place to the enemy. That's why it's important that when we sin, we recognize it, we see it, and then we ask God, who is faithful and just, to forgive us of our sin. And we confess that sin to him. Personal holiness closes the door to Satan and protects us from him when he attacks. When we, are, when we are living our lives in holiness to the Lord, it closes that door to him in those personal attacks. And then last week, we talked about the boots of peace, and that speaks about our foundation in Jesus Christ. When our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, it means that we 
uh, that, that we are saved by grace through faith, and we know it. It's one thing to actually sit there and say, yeah, I'm saved by grace through faith, but when we actually know it and we believe it and we're not moved, we're not shaken from that foundation of that basic truth, that nothing can change our minds, that Satan may come and try and cause us, uh, uh, cause us to doubt, but when we wear the boots of peace, we are sure and secure in our salvation, and we cannot be moved. That we know that what God's word says about it. That, um, that we are saved by grace through faith. And this is not of ourselves, right? Lest any man should boast. It's not of works. So this, uh, tonight, the next piece of armor we're going to study, as I said, is the shield of faith. Because the Bible says, above all, taking uh, the shi- uh, shield of faith, wherewith uh, ye shall be able to quench all the, the fiery darts of the wicked. So, in, so, uh, so let's see why this piece of armor is so important that the Lord would say that we are to have it above all. Because we see those two words on there, you know, it begins with that, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye may be able to quench all the uh, fiery darts of the wicked. The first thing is I want us to look at is the fact of how the shield of faith is designed. How the shield of faith is designed. Now, shields, obviously, you know, to Roman soldiers or any sh- uh, soldier is a very important thing. There, uh, but to Roman soldiers, there were two, uh, two different kinds of, I mean, there, sorry, there were several kinds of shields used, you know, used by the Romans in that time period. But two of those kinds were the most commonly used. There was one that was a small, you know, little disc-shaped one that they would use, uh, you know, obviously for close combat and everything else to try and block a sword or whatever. But the one that he is speaking of uh, in this case is one that, uh, you know, the word he uh, used here is for one that is just to describe a large door-shaped shield. That's what I'm talking about. I don't want the little, you know, the little disc going like this and whatever. I want the door. I mean, it's not going to be as big as that door, but I, I, I want to, you know, if I'm getting some uh, shot at me, I'm getting arrow shot at me, I want a big door. And these shields were usually about four and a half feet high and about two and a half feet wide, and they were designed to cover the entire body. I mean, think about it, four and a half feet. I'm five foot seven. Sometimes if I wear uh, boots, I might get, you know, five foot seven and a quarter. But all I have to do is crouch down. If it's four and a half feet, man, I, you know, it's probably like right about here. I just got to crouch it down and, and hide when those things are coming, right? And so it'll cover the entire body. I mean, even... You know, uh, you know, even you know, a person like you know, you know, Doc, who is probably you know five ten, maybe six foot. I don't know. When I see fiery darts, I'm going to see them coming, and I'm going to go go behind that door. That's all I got to say. You can look at them if you want to. Well, I'm waiting until all the, until I hear all of them go, and then I can go on in advance. I'm not going to sit there and just watch them going, ooh. So, which I know that you're not going to do either. But these shields were usually made of a solid piece of wood covered with metal or a, a heavily oiled uh, leather. And a man uh, could put his, like I said, put his entire behind, uh, body behind it as it absorbed the javelins and arrows of the enemy. In the case of a flaming arrow, uh, very often the arrow would snuff, uh, snuff out as it was buried, it buried itself in the thickness of the shield. During, uh, during battles, these great shields would often bristle with smoke, uh, smoking arrows like porcupines. I mean, you see some of those, you know, uh, some of those uh, movies nowadays where, you know, they're trying to do like the Roman soldiers and everything else, and they're going like this, and it comes out there, and there's a whole bunch of arrows on it, and it, you know, kind of you know, looks like a porcupine by the time they're done. That's the reason why I ain't looking, you know, where the arrows are coming because all those porcupine quills are, you know, being shot right at me. The shield was also curved along its length, so on the sides to provide some, uh, to provide some, uh, some protection. For the soldier's sides as well, so you had it kind of going like that as well. The uh, the shields were protected by a leather cover until they were uh, until they were needed for battle. The shield was one of the most important pieces of armor possessed by the Roman soldier, right? Because you can obviously tell the reason why that they have all this. If they're shooting all these arrows, you know, obviously uh, as you see in those movies or whatever, or reenactments, they always shoot them way up in the air and they come down. There's always like fire coming off of them. And so when the Roman soldiers obviously would go into battle, what would they do? They would all, you know, all get close together, and they would put them over their heads like this. Why? 
because that's where the arrows are coming from. The arrow, I mean, it makes sense, right? And there's often times where, you know, uh, one of the things that you saw uh, or, or that you see, you know, from those is that those in front would obviously stand really close together and provide that front. So they had not only no arrows can get in front, but they also couldn't get in above. And so they would have that going all the way back. And some of the times, you know, what they called, you know, what they say is, is that the way that they would do this is that it would, you know, and, and the ground that it would cover was almost was as much as a mile wide. I mean, that's quite the uh, that's quite the um, you know covering that he has on here. So this is that's how you know it is described as this door shaped this door shaped shield that you know is four and a half feet high, two uh, you know two and a half feet wide. And like I said, you know, the front row would get close together, so they had that front, and then they would also, uh, the ones behind them, the second row on back, would have them up, up top. So pretty much there was no way that you could ever uh, get through there. One of the other things that they would do, you know, uh, in battle, is if they knew that they were coming, you know, you know, with fiery darts or anything else, they would soak their shields in water. They would soak them in water because they, obviously that's, gonna, that's going to, you know, uh, put out that flaming arrow, right? Number two is, is how, I, I want to talk to you how the shield of faith is described. How it's described, and I, I already described some of this as well. That, but we're, we're told, obviously, that this is the shield of faith. Say shield, of, you know, you say, well, what's the shield of faith? Well, the, shield, uh, the faith that Paul is referring to uh, here is not the body, uh, the body of Christian belief. It is, or he is not referring to the doctrines we believe. He's not, you know, believing, you know, all, all his doctrines. He is referring to the simple faith in God. That's what he's referring to, his simple faith in, in Jesus Christ. The faith refers to the belief in Jesus Christ that he alone brings salvation. Because there's oftentimes, I mean, you know, I've said it before, and I, I'm sure I'm not the only one in there. There are days where I wake up and I don't feel saved. Oh, no. A pastor says that there's days that he don't feel saved. Yeah, there, there are days where I wake up and I don't feel saved. But I, you know what? I don't go off my feelings. I go off of what God's word says. Because my feelings change. My, fe- uh, my feelings, have, you, know, uh, you know, probably, you know, at times could be, uh, you know, could probably be described as like shifting sands. They just kind of change back and forth. But God's truth doesn't. God's fir- uh, truth, you know, stands uh, firm, and that's what we need to be reminded of. Just because we don't feel saved or that they were having a bad day, we need to realize what God's word says. Because how many of you know that we're going to have bad days? We're going to have bad days. Good, I'm not the only one in here. I've got a couple of amens on that one. I'm not the only one that has a bad day. But, it, you know, it, it also, but it's also speaking of our daily faith in Jesus Christ that leads to blessings, daily provision, and strength for the journey. This kind of faith is simple faith in Jesus, simple, uh, simple trust in the Lord that saves us, grounds us, strengthens us, calms us, grows us, and establishes us. Faith is necessary. It is a necessary non negotiable component of the Christian life. You can't you know, say, well, one day I have faith, the next day I don't. It's non-negotiable. It, it came along with the deal. When you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, faith came, uh, you know, is there to stay. Even, like I said, even if you don't feel like you're saved, you are saved, right? Amen? Amen? We cannot be saved apart from faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Because the thing is, is that, you know, think about it. If, if it was based on us, if it was based on us repenting of all of our sins or rep- doing all this, blah, 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 would we not be so arrogant as to when we got to heaven and go, Hey, you know what? Did you hear what I did to get to heaven? Somebody goes, no, 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 no. Mine's far worse than yours. Oh, no, 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 no. My sin is far. I mean, how many times I've heard the fact of somebody when, you know, a person comes up and, you know, say they're, you know, from, uh, you know, drug and alcohol recovery program. It's almost at that point that the people in the church are like, well, I don't really have a testimony because I wasn't in this thing, you know, because my, because God didn't save me from as much as this person. God saved you from hell. That's all that, that's all that matters. And I would rather be the one that says, you know what, that I've trusted in God, you know, since an early age. I can't say that because I didn't. 
but my wife can because she can say that because she did. And that's, you know, that's, to me, that's the more powerful testimony is the one that says, you know what, I trusted in Jesus Christ at a very early age, and I never, you know, deterred from it. That's not, you know, they're not saying that they're perfect, but they know that, hey, you know what, at an early age, they knew that they needed him. Some of the hard-headed ones like myself, I, you know, I needed uh, apparently a few more years. Our entire uh, Christian life is built upon and sustained by a, uh, a consistent believing, uh, believing that God is and that he blesses those who uh, place their faith in, uh, in him alone. Hebrews chapter, six, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please God. For he, uh, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I mean, think about this. We live... Uh, we all live by some sort of faith every single day we live. We cross bridges and believe that they will support us. We go through tunnels believing that they won't collapse. We trust electricity, automobiles, airplanes, ships, and buses because, or, or believing that they are safe. Our, our faith in those things is well-founded, for they have proven themselves over and over again. But what more so you know, uh, can we put our faith in than Jesus Christ who is absolutely true that he will never lie, and we know that uh, he's never going to leave us or forsake us. When our faith in Jesus Christ and God the Father, our faith uh, isn't God the Father and Jesus Christ, our faith is in someone who cannot fail and will never fail. So thus, the, the faith of the Christian has power because the object of our faith is all-powerful. True Christian faith never fails because the object of our faith never fails. Who is the object of our faith? Jesus Christ. He never fails. Number three, how the shield of faith is deployed. It, the Bible says that the shield of faith will enable us to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. As I, you mentioned, you know, I mentioned some of this a little bit earlier, but in ancient times, the tips of the arrows were wrapped in pieces of cloth and, uh, that had been soaked in pitch. Pitch is basically uh, the resin from pine trees. This then, uh, then would be set on fire and shot at the, en uh, at the enemy. When the uh, arrow hit, uh, hits its target, the flaming pitch would splatter in every direction, igniting everything flammable it touched. Arrows uh, caused, uh, could cause damage by piercing, uh, by piercing the body. The pitch could also cause you know, serious burns you know, in the skin, and it could burn uh, their equipment and gear. So it was a very you know, formidable thing that I think of. Actually, one of the things I, th I thought about was is uh, Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone, if you don't know, at one time in Booneville, was taking on the Native Americans. For 10, uh, I believe 10 or 11 days, they kept on fighting and, uh, you know, and fighting, and the Native Americans were supposed to overtake them. They didn't, see, the Native Americans were actually, uh, were actually paid by the English to take, uh, to take Booneville from, uh, you know, from uh, Daniel Boone. And so for 10 or 11 days, they kept on going, and they could not get past the fortress. And so finally, all of a sudden, I believe it was Tecumseh who, who says, you know what? Fiery, uh, fiery arrows. That's what we're going to do. Because it, the entire wall was made out of wood. It was all, it was all like big beams of wood that were you know, stuck in the ground, you know, that had pointed tops. And they said, you know what, we're going to burn our way. You know, we'll burn, our, you know, we'll burn them out. We'll destroy this whole thing. We'll just burn them out. And so they began to, you know, shoot them in there. And all of a sudden they're beginning to, you know, you know fear because their fort is made out of wood. They have no way of uh, they have no way of uh, putting it out. They're trying to put it out with water, but they don't have enough water because all the arrows coming in. And some say because of God's provision, they made it. And the reason why we could say that all of a sudden, it hadn't rained. They said for a month. But about an hour or so into the battle, all of a sudden a big uh, a big storm comes through, and just puts out all the fire that was that came in from these arrows. And Tecumseh says, you know what, forget it. I can't, I can't seem to beat them no matter you know, what I do. And that's what you know, the thing is, is that when we have all these things going on around us, and we sit there and go, you know, I don't know if I can handle all these things. You know, that we feel like we're in the middle of the fire of that fort. 
God provides rain and puts it out, right? And like I said, oftentimes when they would go into battle and they knew that they were gonna they were gonna shoot these like fiery missiles, these arrows, they would they would take a, you know the shield of leather and they would soak it in water prior to battle because the leather uh, the wet leather would quench the fiery arrows and protect the soldier behind the uh, behind the shield. Every day the, the saints of God are assailed by fiery darts of the uh, of the devil. The arrows he launches against us are usually the arrows of temptation. The enemy assaults us with temptation to temptations to uh, immorality, hatred, envy, anger, covetousness, and uh, uh, fear, despair, distrust, doubt, pride, and every other conceivable sin. Satan comes against us, continually attacking us and tempting us to sin. The fiery darts of temptation have the potential to inflict great damage on our lives, but the shield of faith has the power to quench all the devil's fiery, uh, all the devil's fiery darts, right? We all have lusts, and you, you, oftentimes people hear that word lust, and they automatically think of sexual desire or anything else. But that word simply means a longing desire, an eagerness to uh, possess or enjoy. So we all have lusts within us, which are easy, uh, easy to ignite. All uh, that is needed is the tiniest flame, and then we are a roaring fire. So we are assaulted with... Uh, with, the, with these hot shaf- uh, shafts of, of sensuality, foul and diseased arrows of degrading passions and, and smoking arrows of materialism. And we burn so easily, don't we? We burn so easily. If we think to ourselves, if God didn't want me to have this, then why did he make me with such a desire for this thing, this person, this pleasure? I mean, my, my neighbor has it. They do it. And so how is it bad for me? That's oftentimes, you know, the way that we look at things, and we try to justify it as much as we can. Oftentimes, you know, we'll mar- uh, you know, we have people that will say, you know what, I'm going to marry this lost person. They're saved. They're, you know, this lost person. Well, I'm going to convert them to Jesus Christ. They often refer to it as missionary dating. And the vast majority of the time, it does not work. I'll give it 99% of the time, it does not work. I'm giving that 1%, but that's probably a little bit too much. Or the fact that we sit there and we say we gossip. You know, we gossip, but we justify it by, by, by talking about how concerned we are about the person. Do you ever know you have those things called prayer requests? I've been in times where a person has a prayer request, and it's all about gossiping about the other person. Did you hear about so-and-so, blah, blah, blah? And they would go on, and they just start telling all their dirty laundry to everybody else that somebody else, you know, that person has entrusted you with. But you go over there and say, well, we need to pray for And you make it sound like you're concerned for them, but all you're wanting to do is gossip about them. I mean, we don't do that, right? I mean, you know, the, the church would never do that. Christians would never do that. So I don't even know why I'm talking about it, right? And think about it, I mean, we, just, we do about 10,000 other things and then try to justify it in so many ways. In the end, it all comes down to the same thing. When we sin and try to justify that sin, we are guilty of doing Satan's will over the Lord's will. And, there's, uh, and, there's, uh, and that is never a good thing to do, right? I mean, think about it. But then comes God's word. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's uh, house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Doesn't that pretty much cover it? I mean, he didn't, he didn't you, know, all, you know, leave an area in there and go, well, I, you know, I deserve this. Or in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication, that every one of you uh, should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, which, we, which would be sexual desire, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man uh, go beyond and defraud his brother in any, uh, any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such 
as we also have uh, forewarned you and testify, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He, uh, he therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. I mean, if we sit there and think about it, I mean, th- you know, the Bible tells us what to think about. So that way we don't get ourselves in trouble. Philippians chapter 4, uh, four verse 8 says, For Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. If you think on those things, your, your mind is not going to go to the other places. I mean, as we believe God's word, as we believe God's word, the shield flies up and the arrows fall to the ashes. They fall by, our, you know, fall by the wayside. If, if we believe God's word and we begin to you know, uh, uh, go out there and say, you know what, I believe God's word and begin you know, to quote you know, scripture in that situation and we begin to resist that temptation, what ends up happening? That shield goes up and the arrows fall to the side. I mean, we know that Satan desires to defeat, uh, defeat us. We know that. We know that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? I mean, we know his job description. When we sin, we doubt God. When we doubt God, we disbelieve God. And in effect, what we're saying is that God is a liar and, I, uh, and can't be trusted to do what he said he would do. 1 John uh, chapter uh, 5, verse 10 says, He that believeth on the Son hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not, uh, not God hath made him a liar, because he believes not the record that God gave of his Son. He's going to sit there and try and cause us to doubt. He's going to you know, uh, sit there and try to cause us to not want to trust the Lord. I mean, think about it. Back in the Garden of Eden, Satan launched his first fiery dart back in the Garden of Eden. He tempted Eve, Eve to doubt God and to distrust, distrust the word of God. Since then, the devil has lit every arrow he fires at the people of God from the same fire. He tempts us in the same manner in which he tempted Eve then. He tempts us all according to the same pattern. And that is found in, that is found in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6, but it's also found in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 that says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. That is how he's going to do it. He's going to try and get you to think of, I don't have this, and I need it. I want it. That's what he wants you to do. I mean, think about it, you know, so, but interesting, uh, interestingly enough, the Lord Jesus, when he was tempted by the devil in uh, Matthew chapter 4, was attacked with the very same darts. Jesus deflected the, uh, deflected the way that Eve should have. The Lord Jesus deflected the devil's darts the way that we should deflect them. Jesus deflected them with the word of God. When those fiery darts, you know, those fiery darts, those fiery arrows come, deflect it with the word of God. And the shield of faith comes up. If we would stand for the Lord against the attacks of the wicked, which obviously we know uh, refers to the devil, then we must stand against him holding the shield of faith. We must lift the word of God together and stand side by side, creating that impenetrable wall we talked about earlier that Satan cannot defeat with his scheming, with his lies. The word of God, the truth of God, is what we must have if we would see the flaming uh, dart or the fiery darts of the enemy quenched. That's what we need to realize. And if you ever doubt God's word, say, you know, I don't know if that's you know, true or not. Well, Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6 says this. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found uh, be found a liar. Psalm, one eight, uh, Psalm 18, verse 30. Psalm 18, verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler or he is a, uh, he is a shield to those that trust in him. 
First John chapter uh, 5, verse 4 says, For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the vit- uh, victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith is more powerful than what we give it credit for. Our faith in Jesus Christ, for one thing, brought you out of darkness and into his wonderful light, right? It's also, you know, the fact that, the, that when something happens, that we have that plain, simple, childlike faith that says, I can trust in Jesus Christ that he is going to protect me. And then that shield goes up. That's what we need to realize, is that our faith is a lot much more than just, oh, yes, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. When you do that and you say, you know what, I, you know, I see this temptation and you, and you reject it, you resist it, because the Bible says resist the devil and he will do what? He will flee. So when you resist that temptation, that shield of faith goes up. So what is uh, the shield of faith? The uh, shield of faith is this, is simple trust in God. Plain and simple. It is taking him at his word and believing him in all things. I mean, I've heard people say, you know, uh, know, uh, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, that should be the way that we, that we go about life, that if God said it, you need to believe it and not just say that you believe it. It is putting him and his will ahead of everything else in life so that when the devil launches his fiery darts, and he will, he's not going to take a day off. We are able to hold up the shield of faith and let them all fall harmlessly to the ground. That when that stuff comes at us, we are able to sit there and stand, like the Bible says, above all, and that shield of faith comes up. When we trust God, we can stand against the, all the attacks of the enemy. The shield of faith is more than just a piece of armor to be taken out for our protection whenever we decide that we need it. The shield of faith is what makes the Christian life possible. The Lord says in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, says, For therein is a righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. This kind of faith is the very lifeblood of the believer. That the just shall live by faith. Everything depends upon our faith in Jesus Christ. It, it's more than just the fact of, well, I put my faith in Jesus Christ when I did this, or I did this. Your whole life is your faith in Jesus Christ. That simple childlike faith that says, you know what? I trust God. I trust Jesus Christ to protect me, to keep me, to bless me, to save me. All of that and then some and more. That simple childlike faith. You know, the reason why it says childlike faith and that we're supposed to have a childlike faith, because you tell a child something and they believe it. They don't question it. They they question it later on in life. They may question, say, why, why? But if we were to sit there and, and go back to, you know, when you're, you know, three, four years old and you tell, them, you tell them something, they believe it. Why? Because their parents told them. That's why they believe it. It's only when they get older that, you know, and, and if you don't watch it, that doubt comes in. And then they begin to distrust it. They Everyone needs to go back and say, you know what, I trust God. Why? Because he said it. And I know that he's not going to lie. I know, you know that he's never going to fail. I know that he's never going to leave me nor forsake me. I know. I trust him with everything in my life. The shield of faith, as I stated earlier, is that simple childlike faith Trust in the Lord, that's the plain and simple truth, is a shield that the arrows of of Satan cannot penetrate. That shield will protect you here. And like the the ancient Roman soldiers, when, uh, when the ancient Roman soldiers who were slain in battle and carried off the, uh, the field on their shields, the shield of faith will carry you home to glory and to bring you into the presence of the Lord. Everything rests upon, the, uh, upon that. So do you stand protected by the shield of faith? Are you rooted and grounded in the truth and ready for the attacks of the enemy? 
I want us, you know, to begin to, you know, I want us to think about that for a few moments. Are we saying that we are trusted, that we, you know, and uh, in, in rooted in that truth, that simple childlike faith that says, I trust him with everything. Because when, he, when the devil does, and he will, he will shoot those flaming darts at you. And is your, uh, when you see him coming, are you going to be dumbfounded by the glow of those arrows coming? Or are you going to say, they're coming, I'm putting my faith and my trust in the shield, Jesus Christ, who is my protector. And you put it over your head and just let them all fall to the wayside. Let's think about that for a few moments.